Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. Um, and this time I'm really glad to welcome back Paula Surridge, who long-term listeners may remember I did an interview with in September of last year, which seems a very long time ago. Uh, Paula is an academic at Bristol University and an expert on how values impact people's voting choices. Um, since we last spoke, uh, there has been a general election, a whole load of new data that's come out from that, and of course, we're in the middle of the coronavirus crisis, or at least the early stages in Britain of the coronavirus crisis. Who knows what that will do to politics, although I think that's probably a discussion uh, for another day. But we do at least have the ability to keep a little bit of ordinary life ticking over. So I thought it'd be really good to talk to Paula to see what we can pick out of the ruins of the general election. And in particular, Paula, maybe just to kick off is, I know a lot of election analysis is based on British election studies data. And for people who are not familiar, it, it, it may just seem like a slightly abstract, almost treated as holy writ phrase when people say, oh, the BES data says this. So could we have to start by you explaining a little bit about what the British election study is and whether we should trust it and treat it as the authoritative gold standard source of information? Sure. So the British election study was started actually in 1963 and has happened at every um, general election since. Um, those early studies were face-to-face -face studies um, of representative samples of the um, British electorate, and they are treated as a gold standard. And I think it's fair to continue to treat the face-to-face -face surveys as a gold standard. Um, but the data that we've got out right now is a new kind of data. Um, it comes from an internet panel rather than a face-to-face -face study. Now that has some really big advantages, but it also has a few drawbacks. So the big advantages are much, much bigger sample size. So the face-to-face -face survey is usually about 3,000 people. The online panel is 30,000 people. So if you want to really dig into small groups and look at how they're, how they're changing, then the panel is really good for doing that. But and it's there's one other, um, sorry, just to jump in there, I, but, but one question about the panel. I guess there's one other advantage, which is that with the panel data, we know what people actually said at the time rather than what people remember afterwards. It's certainly something that's been a common pattern with people who vote Lib Dem is the proportion of people who remember that they voted Lib Dem, say six months after a general election, often drops away quite a lot. So presumably the panel is quite important in that respect as well. Yes, so the panel is important in that respect in that it's done immediately afterwards. Um, and also because it's a panel, you know accurately people's previous behaviour. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, if I was looking at something that looked at how people voted in the referendum by how they voted yeah. in 2019, I've got both of those things measured as they happened, not yeah. people's memories later, which is important. The downside of the panel is that it's an internet panel. Um, it tends to pick up those who are a little bit more politically interested than the general population. It's very... Poor. I don't. I don't think the people who collect it would mind me would mind me describing it such for analysing turnout um, mm. because, because of that increased um, political interest. Those that are completely disengaged from the system are very, are, are much less likely to to respond to to a mm. panel like that. It's also less good for particular types of groups. Um, there's been work done looking at the. Um, the ethnic minority sample in it, for example, is, is considered not to be a good sample um, of that particular population. So there, there, are, there are pluses and minuses. Another big plus is that we've got it now. Um, yeah. If we're working for face-to-face -face data, we would be waiting a good six months. I don't expect to see face-to-face -face data for 2019 until, well, even, even before this crisis happened, yeah. um, and until kind of August time um, this year. And that, but that face-to-face -face data is part of the overall BES uh, operation. Yeah, so that, that keeps the time series, the integrity of the time series back to um, 1964. 
It also, um, if you're interested in turnout, which I think increasingly we will be interested mm. in the turnout at, at that election, they have um, a means by which they go and validate the register. So they send researchers out to validate the registers. So you're not just relying on whether or not somebody says they voted, you've also got a check on whether or not they actually voted. So their measures of turnout are much more reliable than any other source of data on turnout. And one other thing I guess that you touched on there with the reference to time series is that the BES uh, operation seems to be particularly keen on asking the same questions consistently election after or election cycle after election cycle. So one thing that I've noticed in the past and I've often found a little bit frustrating is its questions around campaign activity are things like do people remember having received a leaflet from a political party which doesn't really differentiate therefore between people who have received maybe just the one standard free post election address where the party may have done no other local campaigning and people who received 37 leaflets from a party during that obviously there may be a little bit of the more leaflets you get the more likely you are to remember but some of the measures around levels of campaign activity seem to me at least to be a little bit trapped in we need to carry on with this format question because that's the one we've always used do you think that's fair the bs struggles a little bit on that front so I think that's fair for the face-to-face -face data. Yeah. For that long time series, there is a sense of trying to keep things as similar as they can, although there are, there are changes over time, obviously. Um, it's less true for the panel data, where they <clears throat> not only can they change questions a bit more frequently, they also have much more frequent waves. They don't just have the one-off sample. So they ask different questions at different times. Um, you have both a pre-campaign wave of that data you have a post-campaign wave of that data but you also have what's called a rolling panel during the campaign um, of about a thousand cases a day so that you can actually try and track if a particular campaign event of which i don't think there were that many in 2019 in previous mm. elections we've had kind of little yeah. things that happened but i don't think i don't think there's so many obvious ones in 2019 and um, but you could actually track those through um through the data so for example in, in 2017 people have looked to see if the kind of myth about the um labor manifesto suddenly um bringing the labor vote home as it were um actually happened or whether you know the conservative manifesto in 2017 was a terrible drag on the vote i have to say personally when I'm trying to get my data set down to size, those are the questions. On, on, the questions on campaigning are the ones that I tend to cut out because they're not, they're not my primary interest. Yeah. So your primary interest very much is about looking at values and how voting is driven yeah. by values. So, um, and in a way, it's a little, it already feels like the 2019 election was quite a long time ago in terms of what the coronavirus crisis might do to. Uh, our perception of the importance of social solidarity or our perception of the importance of the welfare system. I think the crisis sadly will really bring out the difference between people who have £500 in savings and no savings, for example. So value, the, the way that values and politics interact may change massively in the next few months and years. But in looking backwards for the moment, as that's really all we can do sensibly <laughs> at the moment, um, what's what's your initial take on what that bes data tells us about values and voting in in that december election so there's been so much talk since the election um about values and when that mm. when people say that they usually mean non-economic things mm. um which i think is a mistake i can i can come back to that in a minute um, so, so much talk about, you know, the social conservatives leaving Labour and, and those kinds of issues. Um, but what I've found looking at the data so far is actually those values were important, but what people felt about economics. And I understand what people think about economics as a set of values as well. Um, right. That both of those things are important. And for the Lib Dems, in particular, I mean, I think at the moment Labour are misunderstanding their problem, but that's their problem. Um, I, think, <coughs> I think for the Lib Dems, the need to understand where the voters were on two dimensions of values is really important. Um, so we've got that 
liberal oh, i never quite know what to call it i probably did this last time i spoke to you as well or when, <laughs> sometimes i just give up and call it the other dimension i prefer to call it the liberal authoritarian dimension mm. because i think it captures what it measures better than calling it liberal conservative for example mm. um so i'll stick i'll stick to that for the time being um and for the lib dems in 2017 and in 2019 the vote is much more concentrated in the liberal groups mm. but that really interacts with economic position yeah um, and i think that's because the other parties are perceived as having kind of vacated the center mm. on the economic dimension and i think also actually have vacated the center on the other dimension and actually lib dem voters are much more in those those central positions on those scales so i ran some models and um, bearing in mind the bes data has only been out about two weeks and i've had a few other things on my mind yeah. other, so, um, i did run some models early on and what i found really interesting and unusual was that for 2019 it is the left right dimension that is mm. best distinguishing labor and lib dem voters rather than the liberal authoritarian dimension which has previously been the case so what you're saying so this time people who were liberal um being liberal in that case didn't distinguish people between being labor or lib dem but then i guess how left-wing they were on that traditional left-right dimension the more left-wing they were presumably the more likely they were to vote labor exactly that yeah and what does that mean where does that mean the liberal democrat voters were on that left right dimension because i guess lib dems could still have been say center left even if labor were generally more to the left um, yeah, yeah or were the lib dems more to the right no i think the, the lib dems were still yeah center left yeah uh, perhaps a little bit more to the center than the left but but in that kind of position um because those that were much more to the right were likely actually to stick with the conservatives um to to a much greater degree now that's not to say that the, the lib dem vote wasn't in the more liberal sections because clearly it was yeah but in terms of switching backwards and forth between the other two parties um that was that was a key distinction and also if you plot the um the kind of average positions on these scales of the different groups of voters I think I have to go back and double check mm. the data, but I think 2019 is the first time the average position of Labour voters is more liberal than the average position of Lib Dem voters. Oh, really? So, so where were the Lib Dems picking up? Well, how, what was it that caused that? Was it that the Lib Dems were picking up some less liberal voters who were also, say, pro-European? Although there's obviously a link between those two, but, but what, was, what caused that? yeah so i think that it's the lib dems picking up um liberal voters from the conservatives but those voters that are liberal within the conservative spectrum are nowhere near as liberal as right. the ones that are liberal within the labor spectrum if that makes sense yeah. um, and what we, what what i've found looking at this stuff over the last sort of five years is that the labor partisans the people who identify with the Labour party have just really drifted off down that scale in a, in a quite remarkable way so that actually um they are some distance even from the lib dem voters and it was that group of very liberal voters who had previously voted labor in 2017 that the lib dems kind of underperformed the most in in terms of comparing the votes won in that group against the proportion of that group who said they might vote Lib Dem. Um, so unpacking that a little bit, I guess the point about the Lib Dems doing relatively better at appealing to pro-European sort of liberal conservatives, I guess that reflects during the election that, for example, Michael Heseltine talked about voting Lib Dem, but say someone like Tom Watson didn't talk about voting Lib Dem. So you can see that. And so in that sense, I, I, you know, I, I think what you're saying, the data says, fits with what most people would expect based on what was being said at the time in terms of who the party seems to be attracting. Um, that point, though, on the left side of the spectrum, where there seems to be a bigger gap between Lib Dem voters and Labour voters, is that because Labour voters 
individually have moved to the left then? Um, or is that because who Labour appeals to has shifted? I presume it must be more the former, because it's not like there were lots of left-wing people voting for other parties other than Labour previously. I, so I don't think it's that they've moved so much. It's more that the composition of the Labour voters changed as bits of it have broken off in various directions. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, as, as we know, in 2019, quite a lot of direct switching from Labour to the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. They tend to be actually on economics, not dissimilar to the ones that switched to Lib Dem. So they are centre left. They are not necessarily yeah. hugely right wing, but they're not in quite the same place as the um, Labour Party were perceived to be and as those that stayed yeah. in the Labour Party were. There's more that Labour overall moved relatively to the left, but because it was losing support on, the, on, on its right flank. Oh, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. I think overall... I, sorry, do go ahead, Paula. I was just going to say, I think also... Um, the dynamics of switching from the Lib Dems after 2010 into the Labour Party from 2015 and 2017 is partly what's been driving um, the shift of Labour voters into those more liberal groups. Yeah. Um, you've got a lot of um, very politically interested, usually degree or higher level mm. educated people who tend to be the most liberal groups yeah. who actually kind of switched away from the Lib Dems and into Labour um, into 20, in 2015, but particularly in 2017, um, which has been driving Labour further, further into yeah. that corner of the space. Yeah. So I think that prompts, I guess, two questions. One is about who the Lib Dems are and the other is who the Lib Dems should aspire to be. So taking <laughs> those in turn, it sounds like from what you're saying that the, for all that the Liberal Democrats have in many ways changed a lot over the last 10 to 20 years in terms of membership, like the two thirds or so of party members weren't a member of the party a few years ago, and the big decline in the Lib Dem vote after 2010, but then actually increasing again back up by half at the 2019 election, that for all of those ups and downs, the part the core of the party in terms of who which voters it attracts has stayed pretty similar because it you know if if you described the party 20 years ago as being centre-left pro-european pro-public services but against widespread nationalization that description i think would have been largely true then and it sounds like it's just as true now of who voted Lib Dem in 2019 is that too sort of simplistic or blasé a view of yeah the Lib Dems are who they always used to be or is that broadly the picture that you draw as well? I think that's broadly true but with one small caveat I would add to that in yep. that there is now or at least there was in 2019 and 15 and 17 more um, competition for what I call the plague on both your houses voters. Yeah. <laughs> so whereas in 2010, actually the Lib Dems managed to win lots of not very liberal voters yeah. who were fed yeah. up with the other two, those voters have got other options now. <clears throat> yeah. At least they did have in, you know, Labour, Labour constituencies um, in 2019. Yeah. So I think that's perhaps the big difference. Not, And that won't be so much true of the... Um, members or the activist base but will be true of the of the broader voting yeah. pool and and have you had a chance to have a look at all about whether that applies particularly around civil liberties because I guess that is one issue that is going to be I mean we're recording this on the day that emergency legislation is going through parliament to introduce all sorts of draconian measures that in any other circumstance would be a cause of an enormous political crisis but I think in this circumstance We'll probably go through on the nod but you can see how questions around civil liberties may well come somewhat to the forefront a bit like they did at the early part of this century in terms of actions taken in that case to try to deal with terrorism so do, do you have a sense of whether the Lib Dems are who they used to be on civil liberties or Lib Dem voters are who they used to be on civil liberties I haven't looked at that it's something I, I will look at the particular set of measures that measure that scale do have two measures in it which are 
broadly tapping that. I mean, I don't think the death penalty is is tapping it particularly well, but it, it does tap into that sort of set of values. There is a certain gut instinct thing, isn't there, about yeah. people who are against the death penalty are also, there's something about thinking that even a horrible criminal is still a fellow human being, which I guess does infuse a wider outlook on life. Yeah, and also the the other measure in well the two other measures in there but one is particularly around about stiffer sentencing mm. which again is that kind of yeah. instinct um and also kind of tolerance of unconventional group which is also a kind of will we tolerate people behaving yeah. in particular ways so so i think that that's that scale that liberal authoritarian scale is actually capturing some of that stuff quite well anyway although there there are going i mean going back through the surveys there are measures that tap civil yeah. liberty slightly more directly so and pending further research um yeah. the answer is lib dems are who they used to be that's really interesting so i think so yeah um just finally then this question about who the lib dems should aspire to be looking at that interaction of the liberal authoritarian and left right axes um is there a group that stands out for you as a group that didn't really vote Lib Dem in great numbers in 2019, but either at some point the party looked quite attractive to, or, or at least are the obvious group for the party to go for next? So the group that, it, it, it's a difficult question because the group that I think the Lib Dems most underperform in, in 2019, mm. are is the group that are the most left on economics and also socially liberal. Yeah. Now, the reason that's a difficult question is because there's quite a lot of competition for that group already. So although it might be a natural place to look for voters, I'm not sure in terms of an electoral strategy, it's necessarily the best thing. But firstly, because Labour's had that vote sewn up for two elections in a row now. So there's a lot of competition there. And when those when that vote does break down, it sometimes breaks the Lib Dems, it sometimes breaks to the Greens. Um, so there's, there's competition in, in that um, group. The other difficulty with that strategy, if you like, is that as Labour have found already, winning all those seats doesn't help you very much because there aren't enough of them. So actually, there might be a better electoral strategy in thinking more in terms of trying to recapture the center ground because mm. actually that's where there's lots of voters who and i mean this that actually the center ground on both sets of scales but clearly the lib dems are going to always be i would imagine positioned <laughs> towards the liberal end of that second scale yeah. it doesn't seem to me to be something that's mm. ever going to be questioned so the economic scale there is a lot of space and a lot of voters in the centre of that scale. Now, prior to this crisis, who knows where we're going to be in six months time. But prior to this crisis, the Conservatives were starting to push into that centre ground. a little bit, And certainly in terms of their voters, they've been pushing into that centre ground a little bit. But it's not a very natural home for them. And it leaves them vulnerable on their very pro-business um, flank as well so there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics here mm. about about where to position and i think it's it's a, a broader question for the party what do the, does the party want to stand for but also where can it compromise um lots of people shout at me when i say that word but but compromise a little bit on values that are not so core to the kind of existence of the party mm. to be able to reach out to a broader group of voters. Mm. Yeah, and I, I guess there are there are multiple sort of knock on factors that could influence that choice, because I think on the one hand, competing with maybe people on the centre ground left right, but relatively liberal, competing with the Conservatives for them is probably somewhat easier when the Conservatives are in government. And if as most governments do, there is a period of significant government unpopularity that feels like it could be quite a fruitful territory to go for. On the other hand, those more left-wing liberal people, um, in many cases, sort of geographically, there's quite a lot of sortation between those who live in areas where it's credible to say, 
vote tactically for the Lib Dems because this is the way to beat the Tories and areas where it's a lot harder to make that pitch because there may even, for example, become a Labour MP or a Labour run council or both. Um, and so it may be that actually in part the party can do a little bit of both because the thing that combines appealing to both groups would be about fairly clearly setting out its stall as being an anti-conservative party, at least in the context of a conservative government. That obviously begins to touch on issues where I'm sure the different Lib Dem leadership candidates will have their own takes. And therefore, as party president, I need to stay neutral <laughs> through that process. So I maybe shouldn't follow that thought process too far down the road. But it does sound, just as a sort of final question for you, Paula, that I almost worry that what I take away from what you're saying is, is going to be lead to complacency because it feels like there is quite a gap for the party that is quite plausible, not guaranteed by any means, but quite plausible the party could pitch for it, and which wouldn't require a major change in what we believe, or at least what we're, what we're campaigning for. But there is a, a fairly comfortable, albeit difficult, route to success in that sense. Am I being too complacent in, in painting it that way? I think, I think actually, 2019 probably taught no one to be complacent mm. and I think you know we can we can see any kind of electoral coalition mm. however long-standing can crumble but I think there is grounds for optimism if not yeah. complacency because actually positioning the party in that sort of space where it and, and it's not easy I mean you know, as we saw in 2019, if you try to position as an anti-conservative party, then 2010 is going to keep coming back over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of electoral strategy, there are now lots more seats where the Lib Dems are in second place mm -hmm. to the Conservatives, where actually squeezing um, Labour and Green votes could happen. And could actually get people, you know, could actually start to, to win seats. So I think there is definitely a strategy there. But I don't think any, well, I mean, at the moment, I don't even take tomorrow for granted, never, never mind any longer. Yeah. But um, I don't think it's a strategy that can be taken for granted because it will depend on what's going on in other parties and yeah. how other parties are yeah. um, evolving. It, it does sound, though, that it, that route, although it's quite challenging in terms of the party needing to massively up its game, doesn't quite require the sort of existential change in who the party is that, for example, the Labour to New Labour transition required for Labour to, to get into a winning position. Um, so I think, yeah, there's quite a challenging task there, but it's one that sounds like um, most people in the party will be up for, which is good. <laughs> given how challenging it is. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time, Paula. That's hugely appreciated. Uh, I'm hoping that when I finish recording on this episode, because this is the first one that I've recorded purely remotely, uh, <laughs> uh, everything turns out fine. Apologies to listeners if at any time the audio turns out not to have been great. That will have been all my fault and not Paula's. But thank you very much for your time, Paula. Thank you very much to everyone for listening. And please do. Uh, Find the podcast on Twitter at Bar Chart Podcast for any feedback on this show or any suggestions that you might have for future episodes uh, and who you might like to hear me talk to uh, next. And most importantly, all the best both to you, Paula, and to everyone who's listening and their families in these very difficult times. Thank you and goodbye. Yeah.